So turn with me again this morning to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. Our study continues at verse 15. Just to remind you of where we've been thus far in our study of this chapter, in verses 1 through 11, the Lord delivered to Moses the first of many important ordinances designed to ensure that the Israelites conducted themselves in keeping with God's expectations relative to master-servant or better employer-employee relations. Beginning at verse 12, the subject changes to God's righteous standards regarding personal injuries, both intentional or premeditated and unintentional. Uh, murder are also uh, listed here. We talked about those in verses 12 to 14. <clears throat> Excuse me, and this brings us to verse 15, where we read this, He who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Now that really doesn't require any in-depth explanation, except to say that this is also one of God's ordinances that's intended to be observed in perpetuity. Why? Because it's rooted in the fifth commandment. One cannot be honoring his mother or father if he strikes them. And lest anyone ever be inclined to do so, God says he shall be put to death as a result. Now, you might be asking, well, Pastor, are you advocating the death penalty for children who hit their parents? No. God did, however. God, in his establishment of these various civil ordinances, instilled penalties on those who were guilty of violating those ordinances that we are kind of unsettled about today. We would never think of putting our children to death should they strike us. We would never think, even if sitting as judges in cases involving others people, other people's children, we would never advocate that the death penalty be meted out for those particular sins. But again, it's not as though God himself has changed. God has the same righteous standard. So then why do we see a conflict between what his standard is and what the penalties are for violating these various ordinances in the world today? Well, God also demonstrates his grace, his patience, his long-suffering, and we are to do the same. So where ideally those who do these things are deserving of death, even back during Moses' day, every one of these cases was adjudicated on an individual basis. It was not automatic, as we'll talk about in just a minute. It was never automatic. These things were always taken before the elders, taken before the judges, and the case was adjudicated accordingly. There were children of a very young age being made to do things that children don't like to do, and sometimes our own children can, can swat us away or attempt to do so. That's not the infraction that is being spoken of here. Generally speaking, what we're talking about is a person who ought to know better, who lashes out in anger at his parents, one or the other, right? And those things need to be weighed very heavily because, again, they're a violation of one of God's Ten Commandments. By the way, the only commandment with a promise that your days will be long upon the earth. What, what's the flip side of that? If you don't honor mother and father, then your days aren't going to be so long on the earth. That's the teaching there. But again, these things were adjudicated very carefully. Uh, it's not that they lived in a barbarous society where... Uh, every little infraction that called for death actually resulted in death. And so we need to understand that going in. Verse 16, we read this, He who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he's found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. Some of you might be wondering, why would kin kidnapping be punishable by death? Why would that be? Well, in God's estimation, kidnapping is a direct assault on himself. 
Listen to one commentator here. He said the death penalty for kidnapping reflects the biblical teaching of the value, worth, and dignity of man in God's image. It is appropriate punishment because kidnapping is an assault on the concept of the person created in the image of God. Kidnapping displays deep-rooted contempt for God and His image bearers. Again, we might not think kidnapping to be that big a deal, but God certainly does. Why? Because it's a direct affront to Him because anything that we do to the image bearers of God is actually being done to God Himself. Remember David's famous prayer where uh, he went to the Lord in repentance and he said, against you and you only have I sinned. He sinned against all kinds of people. Bathsheba, Uriah, people under his command, people within his kingdom. Uh, David was quite the scoundrel from time to time, but Again, David understood that first and foremost, the sins that he committed against others on this level were actually sins against God himself. I think we would uh, do well to adopt that same attitude about our own sin. Let me just ask you a question. When you sin against another person, how prone are you to go to that person first and ask their forgiveness, sometimes without even remembering to ask God's forgiveness for that sin? to acknowledge before God that you've actually sinned against one of His image bearers. I think we've got it just backwards sometimes. We need to be very careful that we understand that every sin we commit is a sin against a thrice holy God. Especially as believers, we understand that. We have a firm, or should have a firm grasp on that concept. This ordinance is also rooted in one of the Ten Commandments. That's also perpetually abiding. Anyone want to guess what commandment I'm talking about? Theft. Right, the seventh commandment against theft. Kidnapping is actually man-stealing. Incidentally, this is actually proof that the brand of slavery referred to previously in this chapter is not the equivalent of the slavery that was so common among the pagan people. Slavery in the Old Testament was, as I said last week, an arrangement that was usually established between the slave and the master. People would voluntarily place themselves in servitude as a slave to their master to get out of poverty, to make sure that their family was provided for, to provide a future for uh, the family, namely daughters who would likely marry into the master's family, and so on and so forth. The slavery that was common in Egypt, the slavery that was common in all of the other pagan areas where it involved the forced servitude of others, the kidnapping of others, that's the kind of slavery that is so repulsive. That's the kind of slavery that was common in this country prior to uh, the late 19th century. And so... Uh, you know, if you're going over to a country and stealing their people to force them into slavery, that is not good, God says. That is man theft. That is a direct affront to God Himself. And if you do that, you are worthy of death. Verse 17, He who curses his father or mother shall surely be put to death. Now, just a couple of verses ago, we talked about striking mother and father. That's worthy of death. Now, the bar is lowered a little bit. Don't even curse your mother or father because that, too, warrants the death penalty. That's kind of harsh, isn't it? Anybody here ever curse your mom and dad? You're, yeah, you're all lying, unless you're shaking your head like some of you honest people are, right? We do that. I mean, how many of you as a young person, probably in your teens at some point, disagreed so vehemently with what mom and dad said to you or had planned for you that you stormed out of the room, slammed your bedroom door, and said, I hate you! Anybody ever do that? You're horrible parents. 
You just wait until I get older. I'll never come back to this miserable house. See, I've, I've said all these things. We're not allowed to do that. Why? Because again, rebellion against parents and cursing is rebellion is rebellion against God himself. Now let me just clarify something that might be misunderstood if we're not careful. Contrary to popular belief, parents did not have God's approval to stone their children for this kind of thing. In every case, as I said just a minute ago, involving capital punishment, parents would be required to make their case before the civil authorities, the civil magistrates, the elders, who would then render whatever judgment was appropriate. Look at Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21. In case you're not familiar with what Deuteronomy means, Deutero, second, Namas, law. Deuteronomy captures for us the second giving of the law. And in this second giving of the law, there are many clarifications provided. Clarifications of things previously stated, namely in this passage that we're reading even now. Deuteronomy 21, 18. If any man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or or his mother, and when they chastise him, he will not even listen to them. Then his father and mother shall seize him and bring him out, out to the elders of the city at the gateway of his hometown. And they shall say to the elders of his uh, city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death. So you shall remove the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear of it and fear. Again, it involves the elders of the city. In some cases, there were probably the majority of cases, people didn't actually get stoned for this sort of thing. The elders were able to work it out. The elders were able to reason together that this was just a case of, of a crime of passion, if you will. This is not the norm. And it's interesting, if you read here these uh, adjectives to describe the son, stubborn, rebellious. These lend themselves to an understanding of ongoing behavior. A, a son who cannot and will not be corrected. Most of the time when we say things against our parents, when we do things that indicate disrespect for our parents, it's a one-off thing. It's it's, a, again, a, a crime of passion. It's just a, a fit of rage. We get over it, we're reconciled, and off we go. Can you imagine if really and truly every child that did this was put to death? There wouldn't be any more people, <laughs> right? So it, there needed to be this, this period of thoughtful adjudication, review of each case, and so on and so forth. It helps to remember at this point that the fifth commandment to honor one's mother and father, again, is that commandment with a promise. And so, given that the promise is, if you obey, you'll be living long on the earth, and the flip side of that is, if you don't obey, uh, you're not going to live long on the earth, uh, that was meant to be a great deterrent to this kind of behavior. Why is talking back to mom and dad so egregious? Why, why is it so wrong when children rebel against their parents? Yeah, because you're, you're questioning their status, their God-given status, which means you're rebelling against God himself. You who have young children, you need to understand that in your children's eyes, you represent God. You are the God figure for them because they can't understand until they're able to understand. What age is that? I don't know. But they can't understand this concept of godly authority. So parents bear the responsibility for modeling that godly authority for their children. Let me just ask you parents something. Are there times when you say and do things to your children that cause them to rebel? Absolutely. This is why we're told in Scripture, Paul says to the Ephesians, you know, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Parents, don't frustrate your children. 
Treat them fairly. Treat them decently. Treat them with a modicum of respect. And I know that's hard for some people because you've been raised in households yourself where you were told, do as I say and not as I do. There was no modeling there. You were told, I don't owe you respect. You owe me respect. Here's the thing, though. Parents, you owe your children respect. How much respect? The same amount of respect that you owe to God. Why? Because they're image bearers of God. Now, that doesn't mean we don't discipline them. We do. Because that is also good and godly. He who spares the rod spoils the child, right? Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from them. There are appropriate cases where children should be punished for the things that they do in violation of your godly standards but make sure they're godly standards. Make sure that you spank your children for violating clear-cut, godly standards and not just your every whim. And It's very important that all of us understand that, including the children. Children understand parenting is not easy. But that doesn't give you license to rebel in these ways, because back then it might just have cost you your life. Let that sink in next time you're getting a spanking, kids, right? Next time you're getting a spanking, think at least they're not killing me. (laughs) At least we're not going down to the gravel pit, right? Verse 18. If men have a quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist and he does not die but remains in bed, if he gets up and walks around outside on his staff, then he who struck him shall go unpunished. He shall only pay for his loss of time and shall take care of him until he is completely healed. I I don't know about you, but that it strikes me as kind of funny. I mean, not funny in a ha-ha way, but really odd that this would even be a thing. You can beat somebody up. You can put him in bed as a result of beating him up. But if after a couple of days he's able to get up and walk with a staff, you're good. (laughs) I mean, now none of us is to be pugilistic. We're not to be uh, in a position where we're picking fights with people. I believe, though, this is just talking about the normal routine skirmishes that can often break out between two imperfect people. People have been fighting since man was, since I guess since since Cain hit Abel with the rock. People have been fighting, and it's not going to stop anytime soon. What this verse teaches us is if the person turns out to be okay, then we need not make such a big deal out of it. Things like this are going to happen. Does that mean we don't need to repent of that? No, we still need to be repentant with regard to our anger, with regard to our actions. We still need to make restitution, as the verse implies. If we cost the person any time at work, we need to make sure we pay that. We need to make sure that we do everything we can until the man is completely healed to make it right. Verse 20, if a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod and he dies at his hand, he shall be punished. If, however, he survives a day or two, no vengeance shall be taken, for he is his property. And again, I I think this is, this has to be at this early stage among those particular sins that God is said to have winked at or overlooked. God knows that the image bearers that he's referring to here are fallen creatures. He knows that they are dead in trespasses and sin, and he knows that they are going to act in ways contrary to his thrice holy standards. When these things happen even in the slave-master relationship or the employee-employer relationship, as it were, there's a different rule in play because notice here that 
Previously, the prescription for the offending party in all of these things that we've discussed already is death. Now, though, we read, the Lord says the offender shall be punished. No death penalty. Some scholars have conjectured that, no, this means the death penalty. It's just another way of restating what's already been said. Others, though, myself included, believe that this is just another case that's to be adjudicated before the authorities. You don't know the whole of a matter until you get both sides, or as many sides as you need to complete that particular picture. Whenever something like this would happen, even involving a slave or master, if a master hid his slave and the slave died, there is a difference in the relationship between the master and the slave and Joe Blow and Joe Schmo just out there fighting. In this case, if the slave dies, again, it's to be brought before the courts. It's to be adjudicated, and that person is to be punished. Now, let me just ask you this. Could that punishment be capital punishment? It could. You'd weigh the scenario. You'd weigh all the facts. And it could very well be that the master committed either premeditated murder or some other type of heinous murder for something that was done that didn't deserve that, and yes, the master could be put to death. But in most cases, these things were adjudicated if the slave, uh, I dare say, deserved, you know, let's say it was a, a life or death situation for the master. Slave rebels, threatens to kill the master. It's either the master dies or the slave dies. That would be another thing altogether, would it not? And so again, reading between the lines here, knowing what we know about uh, the jurisprudence of the day and among this type of people, um, there were safety measures put in place. It wasn't as cut and dry as we're reading it in the text. There were all kinds of things taken into consideration uh, that Moses just doesn't tell us about here. Verse 22, if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there's no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. That's simple enough to understand. Two men are fighting. A woman happens to find herself as collateral damage. The woman's husband can sue for damages, and the offender would be required to pay whatever fine the judge has decided upon. Then the Lord adds in verses 23 through 25, If there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Now it's at this point that I want to respond to an ask the pastor question that was passed to me last week. Not because this passage speaks to it directly, but it is tangential. There is a connection here. The question was asked, what of capital punishment for women who knowingly, purposefully murder their preborn children? In other words, should the sin of abortion be punished in the same way as the sin of murder? The short answer is yes. Abortion is not health care. Abortion is not freedom of choice. Abortion is murder. There's, there's no, I will not budge on that definition. Abortion is murder. Any woman that would knowingly go into a clinic and ask that her unborn child be removed from her womb and killed, it's murder. And any time that we start to obfuscate or start to dumb down such a heinous act as being reproductive freedom or a woman's choice. You have no more choice, ladies, to murder your unborn children as I have to murder any one of you. 
Murder is murder is murder is murder. What about in the case of rape and incest? Murder is murder is murder is murder. One violent act does not necessitate or demand another violent act. Now, what about in the case where the child is threatening the mother's life? The doctor says, Mom, if you carry this baby to term, you will die. Well, you're, you're probably going to be surprised to hear this. And I'm not going to offer an opinion on that either way. I think it's still murder if the woman terminates that pregnancy. But the late R.C. Sproul had a different view. And I don't want this to turn you off of R.C. Sproul, but R.C. Sproul very clearly said that if it can be proven that the baby's going to take the mother's life, then the baby is going to murder the mother. And so any abortive act taken in exacting circumstances where that can be proven that the mother's going to die is self-defense. The mother's defending herself against the baby taking her life. Okay, R.C., <laughs> Those are rare exceptions, though. And those are the very things that people on the left love to bring up as license to murder, but it still doesn't erase the fact that murder is murder. We should consider the taking of an unborn life just as seriously as we take the taking of any other life. And women who do that are guilty of murder. Here's the question. Do we take the stance that many in the abolitionist movement today, those who want to abolish abortion in our country, and, and I do too, I, I want it to go away, but should we take the stance that any woman who has an abortion should be put to death? Some people, it's very easy for some people to say, yeah, absolutely, murder's murder. You just said it, Pastor. Murder's murder. And if a woman commits this type of murder, she needs to suffer the death penalty herself. You may have this Monday morning quarterback sort of attitude, this armchair quarterback attitude about this. But let me ask you men something. What if it's your daughter? Now, you can still play the Cavalier card. Yeah, even if it's my daughter. If I find out she had an abortion, then it's with her. It, you know, let me just say, if that's your attitude, I don't like you. Why? Because your Cavalier attitude gets you nowhere. You know what I want for my daughter should she slip up? at some point, and lose her mind, and this happened? You know what I want for her? I want Jesus for her. I want Christ for her. I want her to be redeemed and forgiven. Even of that, even of that. Now, if you want to go out there and, and be an activist and, and lobby your legislators and try to get a bill passed where, I mean, we were talking about this in the little break room a minute ago, uh, talking about this sort of idea that we can create Christian legislation that everybody in the country is going to be beholden to. Let me, let me just save you a step here. First of all, pray for revival. Pray that God might change the hearts and minds of every person in this country and that the trend, the tide would be turned to the sanctity of life instead of reproductive freedom reproductive rights. Why do I say that? Because unless and until the Lord changes hearts and minds via revival, unless and, until the unless and until the Holy Spirit descends on the hearts of those who believe this way, that these things are okay, unless that happens, man is going to continue to wax more evil and evil and evil with each passing day. And the moment any legislator or any legislature attempts to pass a bill to put women to death for what they consider reproductive freedom, you're going to have a full-blown revolution on your hands. 
It's noble to want that. Absolutely. It's Christ-like to pray for revival. Absolutely. But you cannot tame the mind of the unbeliever so that they will be beholden to your Christian ethics, your Christian mores, your Christian laws. You cannot tame that mind. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And if you can't tame the mind, it's like trying to hand feed a, a, a crocodile. Right? If you can't tame that mind, you will get bit. Bad things will happen. People want all these changes. Well, if you want real change, here's, here's a three-step process to real change in the world in which you and I live. Prayer. Pray for revival. Next, be the salt and light that you're called to be. That means the church at rest needs a little more to be the church triumphant, the church militant. Now, understand what I mean by militant. I'm not saying that we uh, reenact the Crusades. You know, we put on our armor and we go charging off into downtown San Antonio with big swords. It's not what I mean. When I talk about the church militant, what I mean, the church is most militant when she is on her knees. The church is most militant when we are doing the most within the sphere that God has placed us to make an impact for the kingdom and cause of Christ. Are we doing that? No, we're a long way from doing that. The average professing Christian in the world today, you know, they love going to church and they love fellowshipping with one another and they love all the songs and all the Christian music and all the Bibles and all the Bible studies and all the, all the things. But the average professing believer in the world today is doing relatively nothing to change the world in which they live. Fair statement? I think it's more than fair. We need to be out and about showing the love of Christ. We need to be out and about showing people the way is Christ. We need to be out and about making known the name of Christ. And the third thing, trust Him. Trust Him. We say we trust Him. I mean, we are, for the most part, we are Calvinists, aren't we not? Meaning, we place a very high premium on the sovereignty of God, the fact that all things whatsoever shall come to pass are in God's capable hands. This world is what it is and where it is, ethically, morally, because God has foreordained that it would be. But He's also saved us for a purpose. Are we living up to that purpose? If we're going to see revival in the land, people need to see revival in our hearts first. People need to see the real, tangible effect of Christ working in us. That is the most successful means that God Himself has ever used. You think about the great fisherfolk revivals. Uh, you think about the great Welsh revivals. Uh, the Great Awakening, the first Great Awakening in, in this country, not so much the second, that was really kind of a digression, but the first Great Awakening, all it took was for one person in most of those cases to start living their faith before a lost and dying populace. And God did all kinds of miraculous things. I think we need to take a step back again and recognize when we're just being full of hot air, cavalier, off with their heads sort of mentality. Before you pray that someone would lose their life for anything, pray that God might save them. Pray that He might be pleased to forgive them. Here's the thing, unless and until the laws change, 
women will continue to murder their unborn children under the guise of reproductive freedom. The best course of action for those of us who feel so strongly about this issue in particular is to pray that God would deal with the issue as he sees fit and understand all the while that vengeance is his and his alone. God says he'll repay. At the end of the day, just leave it at that. Right? I'm going to pray for your salvation. I'm going to pray that your mind is changed, that your heart is changed. But at the end of the day, God's will trumps everything. And in cases where you do, do the things that you do, God will repay. Verse 26, if a man strikes the eye of his male or female slave and destroys it, he shall let him go free on account of his eye. And if he knocks out a tooth of his male or female slave, he shall let him go free on account of his tooth. Once again, this is not about eyes or teeth. This is about God and his expectation that masters treat their slaves fairly, equitably. Now, you may have noticed that in the previous verses pertaining to injuries sustained by a pregnant woman, we see what's known among the ancients as the lex talionis. The lex talionis is simply this um, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And we hear people ignorantly most of the time uh, quoting that passage as just recompense for one act against, you know, what we're to do about that. Uh, you know what the good book says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's the law of retaliation. Now, in some cases, again, in some cases, this would actually be the judgment. You, you cause somebody to lose an eye, you're going to lose your eye. You cause somebody to lose a tooth, you're going to lose a tooth. But in most cases, even though judges could use this as a form of judgment, it was never intended to be automatic. And interestingly, as I found out, it was actually something rarely used. This principle was not widely employed. The Pharisees are largely responsible for this misunderstanding because they sought to apply this principle to every personal relationship they had, using it as a license to seek one's own personal revenge. Right? In other words, if somebody punched you, what, what did you have the... Under this eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, someone punches you in your jaw, what do you do? You punch them back, right? If somebody insults you, what do you do? You insult them. One commentator said, this principle was thus intended to be a guiding principle for lawgivers and judges. It was never to be used to justify vigilantism or settling grievances personally. And this is why in verses 26 and 27, we see a difference between the remedy and that which was called for in the previous instance. Note that in this case, this wasn't an eye for an eye scenario. The scenario here is, if you're a master and you cause your slave to lose an eye, what's the punishment? You lose an eye? No. You let him go. You let him go free. So that's proof right there that the eye for an eye thing was not automatic and it wasn't something that was put into practice by masters uh, toward their slaves at all. Another scholar said, we have no indication that the law of an eye for an eye was followed literally. There's never, and this is very important, there is never a biblical account of an Israelite being maimed as a result of this law. There's not a single account in all of Scripture, of an Israelite losing an eye because he took an eye, or losing a tooth because they took a tooth. Why is that? Because we're talking about a principle here. We're talking about a well-established principle where God expects, again, the elders, the, the magistrates, the judges, to make judgment calls on these things. I don't 
believe God intends for man to be barbaric against his fellow man in the way that a literal understanding of this would require. You know, you poke somebody in the eye with a sharp stick, they lose their eye, and the judges drag you into court and they say, lay down on the table, we're going to take your eyeball. No. Again, it's a principle. It's not something that they did. Uh, at least biblically, we don't see an example of that. And again, interestingly enough, even historically, we see very few examples of this. It's very fascinating to me, though, that um, in Muslim cultures, you know, if you steal, they'll cut your hand off. Um, and that's because, you know, we can see the the Judaistic influence even within the Muslim faith. They took this literally. And so if you did this, you got the same kind of uh, thing done to you. You got your hand taken off so that you couldn't steal this is the, along the same lines. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. Really? I mean, can you imagine how many like blind Christians we'd have walking around? Right? Because guess what? In this remaining flesh, this eye offends me and I pluck it out. What's this eye going to do? It's going to offend me. So I pluck it out too. Really? Is that literal? No. No. It just means, in principle, deal drastically with your sin. Deal in ways that are unimaginable, perhaps. Deal with your sin in those ways. We actually have a good uh, source uh, demonstrating what God's real expectations were. And who, who might that be? Jesus. Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. And again, thank you, Jesus, for clarifying something that might have us otherwise going off in the wrong direction. What did Jesus say? Matthew 5, 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not, do not return or turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. See, this is Jesus once again helping us understand exactly the spirit and intent behind what God was advocating. He's saying, you've heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which has led you to conclude that vengeance is yours. Jesus says it's not that way. Vengeance is not yours. Vengeance belongs only to the Lord. And so, if you're in these situations, the better part of wisdom instructs us, Jesus instructs us to exercise forbearance, to exercise patience long-suffering, kindness. Why? Because those are the things that God demonstrated toward us. Right? Well, as for the remaining verses here in chapter 21, I think we can just read those without any further commentary. I mean, if you need me to stop, just stop me. I mean, if you have a problem with your oxen, you know... If any of you had your oxen gore, some, gore somebody in this past week, then we'll talk about it. But I don't think that's happened. Huh? Maybe John? <laughs> yeah, John kind of got gored by somebody's ox. Yeah, I don't, Pastor John is out this morning. Uh, one of the little Petri dish, dishes that he treats every week has apparently given him COVID. So um, he's okay, I, I take it. Is he is he. How bad is he, is it? Oh, he was asleep. Well, he texted us this morning and kind of made light of it, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to say he's going to be okay. I hope that he'll be okay. But just pray for him. But that's, that, that's along the same lines, right? I'm sure it wasn't an ox in the ER that did that. But, but listen to this, and we'll just leave this where it's at, because I think it's pretty self-explanatory. If an ox gores a man or a woman to death, 
The ox shall surely be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall go unpunished. Now, that's kind of strange. Why? Because the ox didn't know, right? If, however, an ox was previously in the habit of goring, ah, now the ox does know, right? And its owner has been warned, yet he does not confine it, and kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner also shall be put to death. If a ransom is demanded of him, then he shall give the, for the redemption of his life whatever is demanded of him. Right? Whether it gores a son or a daughter, it shall be done to him according to the same rule. If the ox gores a male or female slave, the owner shall give his or her master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. If a man opens a pit or digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restitution. He shall, give his, uh, he shall give money to its owner, and the dead animal shall become his. If one man's ox hurts another so that it dies, then they shall sell the, the uh, live ox and divide its price equally, and also they shall divide the dead ox. Or if it's known that the ox was previously in the habit of goring, yet its owner has not confined, uh, confined it, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead animal shall become his. You know, it wasn't easy to be an ox back then, I guess. You know, because what do oxen do? I mean, they, if you get into a pen with them and they don't want you there, they're going to gore you. And like I said, they don't know what they're doing, but, you know, ignorance is really no excuse, right? There's also a sermon that could be taught there about ignorance being no excuse. But it was, you know, pretty cut and dry. We use the same logic, I think, in the world today with regard to dogs. You know, I think it's still uh, a law that if uh, if a dog causes bodily injury to another person, then that dog has to be put down, right? Now, the dog might have had pure motives. The dog might have just been defending its territory and so on and so forth. But again, ignorance is no excuse. You know, this is just God's way, again, of ensuring that the society at this early stage of their coalescence just ensuring that this society is orderly, that this society is abiding by rules that they might never make for themselves. This is why laws are so important. This is why law is so good. It provides us with the guardrails. You know, it helps us from just going off in every direction, uh, especially when we consider the moral law of God. This is why, once again, the moral law of God exists in perpetuity. The moral law of God has not been abrogated. The moral law of God is ongoing and will be ongoing until we're freed from these bodies of death. Why? Because we need it. We need God's standard. And oh, by the way, much of our civil law today is predicated on God's moral law. And it's good. It's a good thing. Again, those antinomians who occasionally rear their heads and, and make a big beef about the law is no longer applicable. You have to ask them, then what law is applicable? What is it that governs their behavior? And you'll find out if you can talk to them long enough to have this conversation, you'll find out that for the most part they agree with you, right? Uh, because of their twisted dispensational, generally dispensational ideas about the Old and the New Covenants and so on and so forth, they, they, they recklessly choose to abandon the law as if God did away with that. Uh, he didn't. It's been written on our hearts, in fact, right? And so it exists there in perpetuity. Well, next Lord's Day, Lord willing, we're going to begin chapter 22. Uh, these ordinances continue, by the way. Verses 1 to 15 uh, we're going to talk about property rights, as they were then. And then in verses 16 through 31, we're going to look at a few other sundry ordinances that God gave the Israelites. Chances are uh, we're going to do a lot of just reading the ordinances. I don't want us to get bogged down too much in these sundry ordinances, in these uh, property rights and things like that. We're just going to kind of skim the surface and move on. There's much more to get to uh, later on, that is very relevant. Just know that even though these lessons on these ordinances tend to be fairly didactic, very teachy, 
uh, kind of almost lecture form, uh, they are necessary for us to understand. They really are, because bound up in God's ordinances, as is the case with His law, we understand more about God Himself. And that's never a bad thing. We understand more what is in the eternal mind of God relative to how we're to conduct ourselves. Even if we're not following these things to the letter, we still learn a great deal about what God expects of us. And so, again, we're going to continue exploring these things in our time together next week.